It is the weather, everybody, and Brandon Eidlin is at his dutiful station, his duty station at the Guam uh, National Weather Service over in Tizen. And Brandon, viva liberation, happy liberation to you and your crew over there. And that's kind of a theme I wanted to talk um, in today's segment about because, uh, first of all, we're five days out from liberation, our 79th. Uh, what is the weather going to be like on that day? That is a good question. And so good morning. Viva liberation. Uh, we, we do have a fairly quiet week ahead of us for the next few days. However, we do start to see, uh, start to see some showers start moving into the area around Friday and, and then more substantially so around the weekend. Uh, so let me flip my camera around real quick and, and show you some of the satellite imagery. So Guam is right here in the middle. And so there are some thunderstorms passing by. We have an upper level feature that is helping to uh, create some uplifting motions in the atmosphere. And where you have increasing uh, upward motion, that is where you see the, the higher likelihood for thunderstorms. So all those little uh, popping red red indicators, that is lightning that's being detected. So the next so couple of days- So possibly scary for your drone operators. That's right. So, yeah, for folks that are, are operating drones, these are the conditions you probably don't want to have your drones out there uh, until things have cleared out a little bit. Midweek does look to be somewhat improved. However, as we go into uh, later this week, Thursday, Friday, we start seeing a few more showers start popping up across the region. Uh, but more substantially around Saturday and Sunday, uh, we do have a surface trough. So that's just a, a small little bend in some of the the air motions, low level air motions, that's going to be bringing, uh, bringing some showers this weekend. Uh, mm. But it does look like this Friday, Liberation Day, doesn't look to be too stormy as we have seen on some Liberation Days in the past. Yeah, but Liberation Days in the past, I know because I've been in, I, I marched in the parade when I was in ROTC. We got absolutely uh, downpoured. Other times it's been like absolutely perfect weather. Now, let me ask you though, because I know you're not just a, a practitioner of science, Brandon, you're also a student of history, right? Nan. I know I've been to your office. You guys have millions upon millions of dollars of high tech equipment over there. Are you able to actually trace back and maybe even do like a database query or something like that and actually see what the weather was like when Guam was liberated by U.S. Marines on July 21st, 1944? That is a, a deep and probing question, Jason. <laughs> we, we do uh, have a lot of data. And in fact, uh, the National Weather Service has an office. I believe it is in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, is called NCEI, uh, National Centers for Environmental Information. Uh, it used to be called NCDC, and, and that's where they archive all the data and observations, weather forecasts, and everything that has ever been issued. Uh, they keep a, a massive climate database. Now, for us uh, here at the office, uh, Chip Guard and uh, the late Dr. Mark Lander from University of Guam, they've actually compiled a lot of rainfall data going back to the 1920s, I, I do believe. So uh, back uh, Japanese acquired data uh, in the Marianas. And so unfortunately, 1944, the summer of, we do not have any rainfall data. However, uh, after you uh, kind of pinged me this morning, I did find a, a couple of web pages. I was looking around, and, and, and of right. course, there's got to be some. Uh, there's got to be some accounts floating around somewhere, whether it's from uh, the American side of World War II or the Japanese side. And, and so, let me read you this one account. I, I found this with the National Park Service webpage, uh, and, and so this was featuring uh, July 20th, July 21st. So. If you don't mind, I can read this out to you. This, uh, yes, please. Yeah, be, be, this because, nice... you know, having, some, having been someone who grew up here and went to school here, you know, uh, of course, you know, we have so much reverence for July 21st, 1944. But from a military standpoint, for the troops that actually took the beach and the U.S. Marines who, you know, were bravery beyond bravery, maybe, yeah. it's, a, maybe it's a little bit of a, a contributing factor, but no one really talks about what the weather was like on that day. Was it with clear skies? Was yeah. it overcast? Was it total downpour? I don't know. And, and it makes a big difference what the weather is doing and 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 really the, the success for a lot of these uh, military operations. But I will read this real quick. And, and this is coming from uh, Masao uh, Hiras uh, Hirasuka. Uh, he's the Japanese person who was here on Guam. And I, I'm sorry if I butchered the name. Yeah, My Japanese is, is not that great. <laughs> All right. So. The weather conditions on Guam on the morning of July 21st, 1944, should have been perfect. According to the record, there was a clear tropical sunny sky without any clouds. However, no one should have enjoyed such a beautiful, bright day. 
The island of Guam, which soldiers saw on the 21st, was entirely covered by cannon smoke. The sky, ocean, and mountains were smoke-covered. The U.S. landing had begun. And, and, and then skipping forward, with the first gray of dawn and the sun showing its figure on the horizon, the ocean scene shook the Japanese defenders. In addition to large enemy battleships, over 100 war vessels and over 200 transport ships covered the early morning surface. And that is from the National Park Service, wow. uh, Park History, one of their online books. Yeah, when you think so about it, it sounds you, like, yeah, you tell us about, you know, like having um, like large wave swells and, you know, and, and high, high sea, uh, high surf and dangerous seas. That would have definitely had an impact on, on the Marines amphibious vehicles and their ability to land on the beach. That's incredible. Absolutely. And, and I was doing some reading this morning. And so lately, our low tides, we've had the reek the reefs have been completely exposed. Oh, so yeah. we've seen this uh, lower, this uh, El Nino pattern. Uh, it does result in lower sea levels across the West Pacific. So our low tides are very low. And, and so for these landing landing vehicles to come on shore, there, there's not a whole lot of areas for them to come on shore. And so uh, you've got to have the Western side where you have a little bit more beach uh, to come up versus the, the, the very stark, steep cliffs of the Eastern side of Guam. And then uh, you do need to have a little bit of water, uh, not too deep, because you've got the soldiers who are coming out of the ships, and they need to traverse those reefs. If it's too deep, then they're Good point. carrying a lot of gear, and you they're know, going to have a hard and time. We, and we've got these five-pound raindrops, and it rains very, very hard here. Running in full military gear, like in, in yeah. combat boots and everything, on the beach is very hard to do, even when it's like perfectly dry and everything. I can only imagine like when the, when the sand's a little damp. Yeah, so they're wearing their, their full insight. uniform. They've got their helmets. They're carrying canteens of water because no telling where they're going to find water once they get on shore. They're, they're carrying their weapons, machetes, uh, other gear. They're each carrying pieces of equipment so they can put together larger guns up on shore to fight the uh, to fight the Japanese. But you and know and then all this while they're going through the reef. And, and I'm thinking you got the uh, the sea cucumbers. You, you got the sea urchins you're trying to avoid not step on them. You're trying not to cut on the coral and and they're carrying all this gear across that reef. Yeah, and and if there were you know large large swells and everything, that would have turned up a whole bunch of other things. You know, like there, who knows? But Absolutely. Glad. Glad. Yeah, and, and I was doing some more reading in, in uh, the history.army.mil. So there is a another online book, and and so this was several days after the landing. Uh, so the 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 Marines have come out across a good portion of Guam. They're working their way northward through Barragata. And, and so uh, I'll read this little selection. Losing their way, hacking out new paths through a tangle of trees and vines, hurrying to reach night defensive areas in time to dig in properly, the infantrymen began to experience a full misery of operations in the tropics. The rainy season was now at its height, and drenching, uh, drenching showers alternated with terrific heat. At night, when the men could use warmth, they sat in flooded foxholes and found their teeth chattering. During the day, their fatigue stayed wet with perspiration. And then during the, the night, you were attacked by mosquitoes. During the day, uh, hounded by flies. So pretty crazy. We're seeing that right now with the, the heat and humidity. And just imagine having all the fighting uh, you're, you're battling to stay alive. And you know that, that that's a very good point by you because we think about these we think about what those those brave men did and we continue to thank them for their bravery and their sacrifice and you know and and honor uh, their memory the, the many many liberators who um, freed us from Japanese occupation seventy nine years ago. So Brandon, I look at the weather service. That was amazing. Thank you for thank you for for you know basically peering into the wayback machine and you know and pulling that out because that's incredible. Absolutely. And uh, it's it's crazy to think uh, uh, weather has a significant role in every little thing that we do. And and, and so and the the shadows of major events in history, weather still plays a role. And, and just imagine what if there's a typhoon? Uh, what if there is a typhoon the week before or the, the week after what that would have meant to either the Japanese or the Americans? And uh, so uh, <laughs> I guess we can always just circle right back around to are we ready? Uh, to face what uh, nature can bring, the good and the bad. And uh, and, and I would just uh, kind of follow that up with just a reminder for folks across the region, and, and I'll flash the satellite on real quick, 
uh, across uh, the far western Micronesia, we are watching a disturbance that could uh, try to develop into a depression the next couple of days. So uh, folks who have any plans down there in the far southwest, uh, keep your eyes on the weather and uh, be ready to uh, respond to whatever may uh, rise up. All right. And, and if we do need to talk to you, we know you guys always have our back, as the Marines did for us 79 years ago. And happy Liberation uh, Day to you and your crew over there at the NWS. Man. We appreciate you guys. Absolutely. Happy Liberation Day to you as well.